don't mistake who Jesus is for what he does. A lot of times people want to project their own personal ideas onto someone else or something else and make it into something they understand rather than to choose to evaluate what they may be challenged by in learning to become different than what they're familiar with. And that's what happens when you confront issues that deal with the reality of heaven coming to earth. Because you have earthly wisdom, then you have heavenly wisdom. And God wants to reinvent us into his vision, not our vision. You see, there's a lot of people that want to make Jesus out to be some kind of like wimp because he died on the cross and he did not attack anyone. Although people now want to take somehow that when he flipped over the money changers tables and he took a braid and was driving the animals out as though it were some kind of lashing and he was taking a bull whip like Indiana Jones and beating somebody with bruises and with blood. No, he wasn't. You see, the difference between what Jesus did and what Jesus is is Jesus is the son of God. Jesus at any point in time could have said, I'm done, poof, and you'd have come undone. Literally, you are held together in a diametrically opposition force that says there's no way that you can hold your atoms together because they are opposing themselves. That opposite repelling force that is going on inside your atoms will one day in the universe, like a fervent heat, dissipate. It's being held together by what the scientists used to call super glue. Well, they didn't call it super glue, but they called it atomic glue because they didn't know what's holding it together. And today, if you look at the subatomic structure and you try to figure it out, even into the protons and neutrons, electrons that get deeper and deeper, they still don't know. God says, you don't know because I'm holding it together. Once I let go, it's over, poof, it dissipates, it dissolves, it will dissolve in a fervent heat. Jesus holds everything by his own force of will. And so, don't mistake the fact that God let himself become a servant or become meek and lowly. It doesn't mean that he couldn't have romped himself. And that brings me to a point of where I'm at. It's like, hey, I know where you're at. I mean, I'm like you. Hey, man, I'd like to take somebody out. I'd like to go out there and grab a gun and have some fun and shoot and loot and do all the things that you see on TV, playing with the idea that somehow your violent behavior will solve a violent end. And in reality, violence begets violence. Because you reap what you sow, and if you sow to your flesh violence, you're going to get violence, and violence will be done unto you. Because you'll step outside of God's protection because you're using your own protection. You see, God will protect those who are meek and lowly. But if you act like you've got it all under control, God help you. Go out on your own. Joshua learned that lesson the hard way. He learned at Jericho what God's way was and doing it his way. But when he went out and made a battle plan to take Ai, unfortunately, he learned a very strong and forceful lesson. God said, no, boom, you go out in your own strength, wiped out. And sure enough, the children of Israel lost the battle, and they lost lots of lives. You, in your own strength, probably could beat up a lot of people. You probably could take out a lot of people. You probably could do a lot of things in your own strength. But what did God tell you to do? I mean, when we talk about the Sermon on the Mount, we're not talking about one sermon, and you get to pick and choose which one you get to lose or use or abuse in some way that you get to make up your own idea of what Jesus said. No. The volume of the book is the volume of the book. From cover to cover, we're talking about what the end result will be if you choose not to do what Jesus said. You need to be what Jesus said and become like what Jesus said because any idiot can react. But how many people can 
act upon the word of God as they're being taught it. I know for myself, I grew up, quite frankly, with a mother who was very anti-violence. You know, she tried to stop me from being a violent person, you know, and she did a pretty good job. Any time that I was in some kind of altercation, and it didn't matter whose fault it was, whether they started it, I started it, whether, you know, I was, you know, the victim with no, you know, protecting myself at all, or whether they were, you know, the victim, I got a spanking. I got beat. <laughs> I got a beat down from my mother. And trust me, a truck stop waitress, they got strong arms. I mean, they're used to carrying these plates. And my mother, you know, she was only four foot eleven, but she could carry, you know, like 16 plates. I mean, she was one of those professional waitresses. She'd been doing it all her life. And people wanted her to work at their restaurant because she was good. She was fast. She was like a little road runner. She'd go along with all these plates and things, and you'd think that she'd trip or stumble or fall. And she'd be carrying a coffee pot, too. And you'd go, oh, my God, that woman's strong. And sure enough, she'd look, and you'd see this muscle underneath here that was like just Hulk size. And bam, talk about backhand. You never opened up your mouth around my mother. You used to duck. And I remember ducking. And I was taller than her. But growing up, I guess she had either been abused or she was confused. She didn't have enough men in her life because, believe me, none of the men in her life stuck around very long. And she was the other woman as opposed to the woman. And so I grew up without a father, but my mother was a very strong-willed woman. Whoa, she was the best father a man could have. <laughs> my mother. And what she taught me by way of spanking me over and over and over and over and over and over again, all the way through high school and through, I mean, through high school, through elementary school and up into junior high, was not to have violence. And I used to get stomped on because people found out. I used to get, you know, beat up. I used to get, you know, like thrown down on the ground. My lunch money when I was in elementary school got stolen from me by a bunch of girls. Yeah, girls. You know, they used to rob me every day for a while. You know, this was before there was bullying. You know, and people talk about all these... <laughs> I laugh about it. I think, oh, give me a break. You know, I said, I, I've been there. Don't tell me about bullying and killing yourself. Jeez. You know, I remember running from girls. <laughs> Matter of fact, I remember one of this, this one girl that I fell in love with. Her name was Linda Barnes. You know, it was like elementary school. She was the best jock that, you know, men had. Because she was like tougher and rougher and stronger. She was like a forerunner of what was going to become Amazonian women. Okay, maybe she was ahead of her time or whatever, but she was like really athletic, you know, and she, she used to run around, you know, the elementary school pantsing boys. Man, Santa Ana, <laughs> what can I say? This was way back when. Back then it was kind of like, you know, just kind of goofy. Nowadays it would probably be serious. People would be locked up for that stuff. But I remember having to go to school and I knew that if I came home and my mother found out about anything, I'd get a spanking. Sure enough, I'd get beat up. You know, that's what I used to call it. Because I'd get whipped. And my mother could whip pretty good. I mean, man, you know, she used her hand. <laughs> Ooh, ow. <laughs> yeah, it hurt. You know, and besides that, it hurt here because I was disappointing her. And so, my mother, when she found out that, you know, some girls robbed me of my lunch money, like one time she sent me to the liquor store in order to buy a loaf of bread, she sent me with bottles that I was going to turn in, and once I turned the bottles in, the girls came in the liquor store and stole my money. Well, I came home and my mother spanked me, sent me to my room, and then she went down and she had words. <laughs> I don't know what she told them, but I never had a problem again. I think she put the fear of her in her. She didn't know much about the fear of God because my mother wasn't very religious. But you see, I was trained not to be violent. Later in life, you know, one time I remember that, you know, a kid across the street, you know, he used to he used to beat me up regularly, you know, and that was later on in high school I had a best friend, same thing, you know, it was like I just couldn't keep my mouth shut for some reason, you know, even though I learned it, you know. But a kid across the street one time, you know, he decided that he was going to, you know, have at me because he'd seen all this going on. So he says, I'm going to beat you up, you know, and your mother's going to beat you up, and you know what, you can't do a thing about it. So I bopped him one. I mean, I hauled back and don't know what happened. I must have flipped out or something because when I hauled back and I unloaded, 
I might have broke his nose for all I know, but I know that I hit him so hard that he went flying backwards, fell down, rolled on the grass, went running up to the porch door at his house, and I went walking after him with my hands down, just boom, 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 boom. I was going to get him. <laughs> yeah, because I was mad, and I was going to get him. And so I went up to the por porch door, and his father locked the door on him. His father said, be a man. You get up. You quit crying. You fight back. I watch you. You fight. You fight. And I stood there, and I got sick. I watched, and that kid was crying. And that father was yelling at him, telling him to fight. And I cried. And I turned around, I went home and got spanked. <laughs> well, what can I say? It's the truth. <laughs> you see, God was intending for me to be someone that he wanted me to be at the end of my life, that he needed to plant the seeds of at the beginning of my life, even before I was saved. So he needed to do something in my life in order to change my nature. And it was funny because... After elementary school, I got moved out of the city into this kind of rural kind of area, which little did I know that once I grew long hair, they were going to come after me and, you know, kind of cut my hair regularly and, you know, bully me and all kinds of stuff. But I had a best friend who really admired me in one way, but on the other hand, really, I'd tick off every day because he'd come over to my house and change from his Levi's into bell bottoms. <laughs> He'd take off his, you know, square plaid shirt that his parents wanted him to wear because he used to get beat with a belt. I mean, he was seriously one of those child abused kids. But he used to come over to my house and change clothes, you know, because we were kind of liberal. <laughs> my mother was a hippie. But he'd come over to my house, you know, and then sure enough, we'd take off and go to school. I'd start in on him. I'd open my mouth and he'd grab me by the throat, you know, throw me down on the ground and start wailing. Bam, bam, bam. Start beating a snot out of me. Because he'd tell me, cha, cha, cha. And he'd just be wailing. Because he was a strong kid. You know, he used to clean the stalls. You know, we had horse. he had horses, we had horses. But he was strong. So he was my best friend, though. I liked him, you know. Why? Who knows? <laughs> One of those weird things, you know, the, you know, I think I got, you know, Stockholm Syndrome. But I liked him, and he liked me, you know, and there are times we got along. But there are times that I'd open my mouth once too many times. And so he'd start beating on me, you know, and I'd tell him, go ahead, hit me again, make you feel better, hit me again. You know, and I'd be crying, and I'd say, and sure enough, you know, he'd get done beating on me, you know, bomb, 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 do it a beat down, you know, and I'd be laying there on the ground all kind of messed up, you know, and I'd say, yeah, you feel better, see how stupid that is, feel better, go ahead, hit me again. <laughs> and I'd get hit again. Duh. And the funny thing was, was that I remember getting beat a lot, you know, and even though he was my best friend. But I remember later also, I started, as I was in junior high, I would see elementary kids get into a fight after school. Because, you know, you'd hear the word fight, you know, and all the kids from the neighborhood would run over, and, you know, they'd all be in a circle, you know. I'd go over and break it up. You know, I was an older kid, so I'd just go over and break it up. I'd say, no, you're not going to fight. No, you're not. Go away, go away, you know. And they began to call me peacemaker, <coughs> which was weird because I was insane. It was like... Where did that reputation come from? It was interesting. Interesting before, way before I ever got saved. So down the road, you know, God saving me and telling me about violence and violent means and everything isn't a shock for me to know that while you may have the ability to use violent means, violence is not an answer of itself. But don't get me wrong. I have that nature inside because, see, I had a chance also as an adult to exercise that nature. I was working in a rather seedy motel for a rather questionable millionaire. He, uh, very prosperous, he was an ex-con and you know he'd gotten out of prison and he was a, in his own mind a big name in Alaska in Anchorage, you know, and <laughs> he was a character, you know, he liked to wear flamboyant clothes, he was older, older, you know, he had a stripper for a wife, you know, and had some kids by her. And, you know, he, he wanted to live that lifestyle, you know, and he was like, oh, whatever. But inside his heart, he was a lonely man, you know, and he was desperately needing, you know, more than what he had. And God brought me into his life, and I had a chance to sort of help, you know, in some ways. You know, in some ways, it was like interesting challenges. But I was put in charge of this one unit, property management. I was uh, the property manager, and uh, he needed me to clean it up. Basically, it was full of, you know, 
drug addicts and people, you know, fly-by-nighters and overnighters and hookers and all these other things. So I went in, you know, and I'd rent it one by one, you know, as I gradually, you know, I gradually would not rent to people. And some people, you know, I got long-term people that would stay longer and they needed a place that was, you know, we would negotiate, you know, a certain amount of, you know, how much they would pay. And so we gradually started cleaning it up and getting it fixed up and then getting it nicer and nicer and nicer, you know. And um, I was the only one of all of his managers that could make money at that place. Every place else of his properties was losing money. I was making money. I'm good at making money. So one of the things that I had the opportunity to do as far as violence was concerned was that if somebody needed to be evicted or somebody needed to be excused out of their motel room because of whatever they were doing, like breaking things, beating up their girlfriend, their wife, their friend, their neighbor, their relative, whatever, you called the Anchorage Police Department and they would get there eventually, but you took care of it yourself. So what I would do is I'd go up, knock on the door, you know, and I had to pass key if I needed it, or I would, you know, take the door off, you know, the hinges, because sometimes they would bolt it or make up some boarded thing, you know, and I'd get in one way or another. It didn't matter, I'd get in. And sure enough, there'd be some big guy, you know, and I'd, I'd escort them out the door. Their stuff came out, the, it was three stories high, by the way. There was a big, giant balcony. They could have flown off three stories. I'd take them and set them outside the door. You know, never hit anyone, but I would grab them. And the force of the ability of the strength that God gave me at the time was like Samson. And so I had the chance, I was like, huh. I'd walk away going, wow, man, you know, there's some, there's some muscles here, you know. <laughs> man, I'm feeling like MMA. Hey, <laughs> we could do it our way. But, you know, you have that nature inside, that ability. But that doesn't mean you use it. Because, you see, I also, later in life, and also earlier in life, was confronted with gangs. When you're in a gang confrontation and a person is violent by nature and he can pull a gun on you or he has a gun pointed in your face and you're talking to him, you're not thinking about violence. You're not thinking about taking the gun away. If you do, you don't think about it first. You just do it automatically. You know, you move so fast that the eye can't see what the hand is about to do. So you don't, you don't pre-imagine it because it also gives away in your flinching from your body and all kinds of body language things. But the point is simple. You don't do it. You talk. And that's what God did with the children of Israel. He talked to them. Jesus, when he came to the world, didn't come here to destroy the world or to condemn it. He came to talk. He came to reason with you, to tell you there is a better way. You see, the children of Israel already knew the violent way. They'd already seen what violence could do. They still wanted that, but they wanted it to solve their issues through violent means. And Jesus said, no. I've got a way that will solve it for eternity. I've got something that will cure and take care of for all time, all the issues you have, if you'll trust me. Well, obviously the children of Israel didn't trust Jesus when he came. And the sad part of it that was, was that they decided to use violent means. And so in 70 AD, God destroyed Jerusalem. Oh, he used the Romans to do it. But with the Bar Kochba revolt, you know, Simon Bar Kochba being the new Messiah that the rabbis had said, oh, this is our Messiah, he's going to deliver us from the Roman rule, the Romans came down hard and stomped on him and wiped him out. That's what will happen to you if you choose violent means as a Christian. God will use some means to stomp on you. Because, you see, he likes a broken and contrite spirit. He'll put you on the ground one way or another. He'll take away your ability to own a gun, much less to use a gun, or to protect yourself in some way that you think that you can be, you know, Mr. Macho or Superman or be some hero to your children, or even some war veteran that you think, you know, with all your medals that you somehow done God a favor. That's not what Jesus said. I'm sorry, but the number of kills is not the number of thrills. The number of kills you may have is just the number of failures to do what God said. Bottom line, blood requires blood. The fact that you can be forgiven for all those things that you had to do in service to your country is a wonderful joy of what grace is and mercy. But that doesn't mean that God sends you to be, you know, like the salvation of a nation. I'm sorry, but the salvation of a nation is not done by the Christians fighting in wars. The salvation of a nation is done by God intervening in 
the world itself by his own ability. And we see that manifested in the Great Tribulation period that's coming very soon upon the world. Those nations that have chosen to fight are all brought together in a violent place to say, look, I'm ending violence once and for all. It will be annihilated. It will be terminated. There will be no more violence from this day forth. And Jesus will say one word in the Valley of Megiddo, I believe. Peace. Be still. And once he does, poof, everything in that valley flies apart. The blood is so heavy, so deep, and so wide that it fills up even to the what they call a horse's bridle. If you've seen the Valley of Megiddo, it is wide. It is like the mountains way over there. So it's flatlands. And if you imagine all the armies of the world meeting there for one last battle, hey, dude, the only way that you could possibly get that much blood, literally, is for the physical being to fly apart. And that's what a spiritual battle does. You see, we could operate and say, oh, well, you know, we're going to come riding in on horses. You know, we're going to have guns. And we're going to make like Rambo in the Valley of Megiddo. No, you're not. You see, there are no guns in heaven. The word of the Lord that comes forth from his mouth is like a flaming sword that slays with just the word of his testimony. And so when John said those things, it gave away a lot of what the reality of what a spiritual dimension looks like. And it reveals to us something true about what Jesus says and how though I don't believe in name it, claim it, or profess it, possess it, or any of those things, a certain amount of truth of that happens in heaven when God speaks. When God speaks, things happen. And so if God says peace, poof, is peace. The consequences of that on earth in the physical realm is shh, end of violence. <laughs> and guess what? He holds everything by his own sustenance, his own being. He holds it by himself is everything retained or contained within itself, within the atom structure. So if your physical body decided to just, you know, like repel the atoms, whoo, you'd be left with uh, blood and dust. <laughs> Uh-oh. And it ain't gonna rust. It's going to fill up that wide valley because blood requires blood. You take a life, you give a life. Jesus gave his life for those that murder today, for those that kill today, for those that are doing things, quote unquote, that they need to be forgiven for. That's why Jesus died, because sin requires a blood offering. It requires the blood of the lamb, or blood of a lamb, to be offered to God, to be acceptable in his sight, to be made holy, to be made pure, to be made clean, to be made nonviolent by means of which God had to use violence against his own son. And Jesus was willing to do that. And that's what we need to be, the willing sacrifice. Are you willing today to give up your rights? You know, the right to bear arms, the right to fight back, the right to be in the right, when the Bible clearly says, let be wrong that God may be made right. Let yourself be made wrong so that God can lift you up into the righteousness that he has for you. Even if you are right, then let it be known as being wrong because God knows what really is going on. And that's weird in Proverbs when it says that to cover a sin or to let something go on. Because you see, the nature of people is to fight. The nature of people is to reveal. The nature of people is to exercise my judgment my self-righteousness. I'm in the right. I'm going to go sue. And yet God says, don't do it. See, God doesn't tell you to go out and you know harm yourself at all. The one time that he said, go buy a sword, was for just the prophecy to be fulfilled. He didn't say, buy a bunch of swords every day. You know, and he didn't tell all 12 of them to buy it. He said, go out and buy a sword. And he says, well, we got two. Oh, that's enough. You don't need any more than that. Two for 12 people, for 120, and for all those disciples. Yeah, right. That's enough. For what? for one purpose and one purpose only. Because Peter was going to slice the ear off the high priest, or off the priest's servant, high priest's servant, and Jesus was going to heal him. There's more of that message and more of that story that meets the eye, and you may want to consider where your ear is at right now and what you're listening to. But 
then again, you can probably try to create for yourself your own image of Jesus. Try to make him into an MMA wrestler or, you know, a god on steroids. But you're going to find that just because God has the ability doesn't mean that he wants to exercise that. Because he wants your humility to be your guide. He wants you to humble yourself. He wants you to come down off your high horse and to be made a servant of all. That even in your death, by the word of your testimony, by the life that you lived, by the love that you give, by the mercy you extend, by the grace you've been given, you might be able to be that witness to the world. Because the world wants a violent Christianity. The world wants the answer to be through violent means. The world wants everything else except for the peace, the love, and the joy that God gives. God doesn't want you to do something. Often God just wants you to watch and see what He can do when you can do nothing. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. These words contain God's command to the believer when he is reduced to great straits and brought into extraordinary difficulties. He cannot retreat. Uh-oh. He cannot go forward. Uh-oh. He is shut up on the right hand and on the left. Oops. What is he now to do? The Master's word to him is, Stand still. Be still. Wait. It will be well for him if, at such times, he listens only to his master's word. For others will come alongside. Evil advisors and good advisors will come with their suggestions and their advice. Despair whispers, lie down and die. Give it all up. It's over. But God would have us put on a cheerful courage even in our worst times, and to rejoice in His love and faithfulness, despite the situation we face. Cowardice says, oh, retreat, go back to the worldling's way of action. You know, get violent, get, get mean, you know, go out. It's a good day to die, you know, and go out with a bang. But you cannot play the Christian's part, it's too difficult, so just give up your principles. Just do it, and fight, and be right. But however much Satan may urge his course upon you, you cannot follow it if you are a child of God. His divine fiat has bid thee to go from strength to strength, and so thou shalt, and neither death nor hell shall turn you from your course. For what if for a while you are called to stand still? So what? Yet this is but a renew your strength for some greater advance in his timing and his will. Precipitancy cries, do something. Don't just stand there. What's the matter with you? Don't you know you have to do something now, now, now? Stir yourself to stand still and wait at sheer idleness. God helps those who help themselves. God can't use you unless he moves you. God only uses a moving force. Your footsteps are ordered of the Lord, not your standing still and waiting on him. Or are they? Always that will bid you to do something so we think instead of looking to the Lord who will not only do something but will do everything for you without you doing anything. Presumption boasts, oh, if the CV be for you, march into it and expect a miracle. Expect your deliverance. It's coming. It's there. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah, presumption boasts many things. but consumption of that boast will cause bitterness in your soul. But faith listens neither to presumption, nor to despair, nor to cowardice, nor to precipitancy, but it hears God say, stand still. And immovable as a rock, you stand. Stand still, keep the posture of an upright man, ready for action, expecting further orders, cheerfully and patiently waiting and listening to the directing voice, because it will not be long before God shall say to you, as distinctly as Moses said to the people of Israel, go forward. 
Stand still and see the salvation I bring is another scripture that God often uses to reveal what He will do as opposed to what we will do. You see, I have no problem with what you will do. I know. I've seen human nature. The natural man, in and of himself, always has predictable responses. Psychology, sociology, the study of human nature, behavioral sciences, all of these things teach us and are accurate in some ways of what we will do without the Spirit of God. What a person will do in the natural realm, what the flesh wants to do in every manner of with which it fights against the Spirit inside, as our spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit, and we are at a twist between which we should go for, whether we would listen to ourselves or we'll listen to the Word of God as God speaks to us in our spirit and tells us to stand still and watch and see what the Lord will do. Often people tell me, you can't you know, just be still and expect to be fed. You've got to do something. And I laugh because I have been fed by standing still. I've been there. I stood still in Jerusalem when I had no food and a man walked by with a bag of bread. No lie. Matter of fact, he had such a huge, giant bag of bread. He was getting rid of it and throwing it away because it was Shabbos. And at the end of Shabbos, or I can't remember if this was at the end of Shabbos or if it was the beginning of Shabbos, but he had to get rid of the bread. He walked by with a giant bag of bread, and I was out of shekels. I was no food and no place to go to get food, you know, and I was hungry. And I said, Lord, you said that you would not, you know, forsake your children, you know, that you, you would provide, that you would take care of me, you know, and God, I barely got here, you know, with a plane ticket, you know, I said, man, it was like, you know, every cent I had. And now I'm broke, I'm out of money, you know, and yeah, you gave me a place to stay, and I had a place to stay, paid for the month, you know, it was a hostel, you know, the Mediterranean, the old Mediterranean, um, which is called the Petra Hostel, hostel, and uh, it was a great time, man, I lived there for a year, <laughs> or well, not there only, but, you know, lived in Jerusalem for a year, but I was hungry, I uh, used up all my money, had no money. How am I going to eat? What am I going to do? How am I going to take care of myself? Am I going to get a job? Am I going to beg? And I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, you know, you said you've never seen any righteous forsaken nor his elect begging for bread. And yet, Lord, here I am begging for bread from you. you know. And so I was sitting there, you know, kind of whining. And God said, stand still. I went, that's not an answer, Lord. <laughs> Whenever I get those kind of questions, you know, I ask a question to God and God gives me one of those kind of answers. I'm like, that's no answer. That's not what I said. Let's get clear, God. You may have another agenda on mine, but I have something I need to deal with right now. I don't care about your agenda, Lord, but I want to know now what my answer is, not what your problem is or your solution or what you want to do to me or what you want to teach me. I want my answer answered now. And so, you know, of course the Lord ignored that <laughs> when he told me to stand still. Once he tells you something, he ain't going to keep repeating himself. <laughs> he just said stand still, so I was kind of like, fine. So I'm standing there, you know, outside the Petra Hostel, and suddenly a guy walks by with a bag of bread. Okay, Lord, I knew it all along. I just had it to stand still. So I followed the guy, and I got the bread. <laughs> Man, I scarfed. <laughs> I must have ate half that bag of bread. <laughs> I was like, whoa, it was good. <laughs> no, it's not rotting bread, so don't go there. You know, it's just it's fresh bread. You know, I mean, it's just they have to get rid of it, clean it out of the bakery, all that stuff, because everything's made fresh in Israel. Believe me. So things are just, you know, like a lot more taken care of people there in some ways, you know. Although there's a lot more bias and prejudices there too. But the point being is that God took care of me. Just as he did when I was getting beat up at times and I'd open my mouth and get stomped on again. Just at times when I was acting like, you know, on my own behalf, you know, and I was being strong and throwing the guy out of a room, you know, and, oh, I'm so big and bad, you know, and just as God today, you know, when I was facing or today in these situations where I've been faced with guns in my face or I've been, you know, people bigger than I am, smarter than I am or stronger than I am, you know, and I know I can take them out. That's not a problem. It's easy once you know how, you know, you can pretty much kind of take people down or take them out. But the point being is that you don't have to. God will do for you. And what God can do for you is so much more than what you can do for yourself. Why do what you should not do when the Lord tells you, stand still, watch?
I personally have taken a completely different approach on life. I live my life now according to the Elisha principle. Elisha was a very interesting prophet of God. He cracked me up. I mean, he just trips me out and blows my mind. He is probably my hero <laughs> of all time. Yeah, I'm serious. Like, here he is, you know, he sees, he sees Elijah, you know, Elijah the great prophet, you know, wow, the guy with hellfire and brimstone, he called down fire, although at times he was scared brainless, you know, by a woman, but, you know, Elijah, the stories, you know, all about the, you know, prophets of Baal, you know, the queen, you know, and all that stuff, you know, and going on, you know, and how he called down fire, you know, they challenged him, and then he called down, you know, famines, you know, or called down, you know, no rain, then rain, you know, and all that stuff, you know, that story. But the Elijah part, isn't that interesting? Elijah was kind of like, you know, watching him and says, hey, you know what? You're, you're not going to be around much longer, I could tell. <laughs> Boy, could he. He says, I want double what you got. He says, well, I can't promise you that, but if you're around when I'm gone, you can have it. I was like, okay. So he hung out. And he stuck with him until finally Elijah's, you know, exit stage right and jumps in a chariot and heads for heaven. So Elisha gets double what Elijah had. Hey, he's my hero, man. You get Elijah sitting there in bed, you know, saying, hey, you know, and they send the king's servants, you know, to him and says, hey, you know, Elisha, you need to come down. The king wants to talk to you. He says, if I'm a prophet of God, he says, you know, that God sends down fire and consumes you. Poof, you know, they're toast. You know, they're post toasties. So another regiment comes, you know, another regiment, and finally they figure out, uh, Elisha, you know, I don't really want to die. You know, I know you're a man of God, and, you know, if you want to, if you would like to, would you please come and talk to the king? You know, because we heard that you hear everything before it even happens. And you already know what's going on. So, you know, I, I already know that you've already wiped out all these people. And, you know, Elijah was like, no worries, no frets. As a matter of fact, Elijah was shocked when he didn't know what was happening. Whoa, what happened? What's this woman coming to me for? You know, and he didn't know. The one time he didn't know. And he was surprised by that. Or like when he was telling his servant, you know, like he said, oh, my God, Elijah, you know, look. The armies are coming. They're going to wipe you out because they heard that there's a prophet in Israel, you know, and that he's telling them everything the king's plans are. And Elisha says, piece of cake. He says, God, open his eyes. And sure enough, God opened Elisha's servant's eyes and behind that army that was coming to destroy them. I mean, after all, you'd think that Elisha would have told the king of Israel to go get an army and raise it up. No, there were angels standing behind the army that was oncoming. And the angels had fiery swords in their hands. And the servant says, oh, okay and quit worrying. So when you need to worry, when you need to do something, or you think you've got to, you know, like, get off of your peace, love, and joy routine, you know, with Jesus, and you want to get into, you know, like the hardcore, you know, kind of like, let's go into tribulation period kind of person, you know, and you want to get violent about it, you know, and you think that somehow some Christian, you know, teaching that's modernized to give you the freedom to be some kind of, you know, bloodthirsty, you know, warmongering, violent person, got news for you. 80% of Christianity thinks that right now. They think that somehow violence is the answer. I'm sorry. You go for it. You know, you go be Moses and you won't enter the promised land. You may be used by God, but guess what? You're not getting the rest of the story. You could strike that rock. When God said, no, don't strike it extra. Don't beat it. Just do what I said to do and don't hit in anger or be angry. So, your choice as a Christian really is to be Moses, who didn't enter the Promised Land, who will soon, but he's still got work to do, and he's still being worked on, or to be Elisha, who's like, eh, you know, I'm just here taking a nap. You know, God opened my servant's eyes so he could quit bugging me so I can go back to sleep. You know, kicking back, laying back, and saying, God's got it in control, man. My father, he, he, he's got it. He's like, check it out, dude. Open their eyes so they can see, because they don't know what clue what's going on. And once they do, then you don't worry about it. God's got it in control. As a matter of fact, he's got the whole world in his hands. So what will you do? Will you be old Mo? You know, still work to go? You know, got a long ways to go before you get there? Or are you going to be Elisha? Elijah, Rock, Sha, Sha. Oh, that's wrong, Elijah. But Elisha. You know, the one with the S, not the J. Hey, what can I say? I like being at peace. How about you? There's only one way to get it. And that's to stand still and see the salvation that he brings.